Next piece that I think I'm probably going to attack is the cross slide knob. Now I've heard that this can be a bear to do and I can see why. If you look at how it's laid out, you have a 5 30 seconds ball on the end, 3 16ths in the center, and a 1 8 on the end on this side, and a square through the middle. So this is only approximately just over a half an inch long, 20, 12, 13, about 13 and a half millimeters, give or take. So it's 437 center to center for the ends. And the one thing that they don't show you, or the one thing I just, you know, it's eating away at me. I just don't believe that this is drawn correctly. This is not supposed to be a spherical feature right here and here on either side. That little hourglass shape that you're looking at right there, I just got to believe that that's a mistake. That is supposed to be uh, straight up and down. If this were a weldment and you were connecting tubes to another vertical cylinder, it's going to look like that. But when you have a round cylinder intersecting a ball, it does not have that little scalloped feature right there. So that's going to be one of the things that's going to throw you off track. I'm going to take this into the whiteboard. This is a perfect example to show you how I'm going to approach this and possibly give you a little bit of geometry and trig along the way. Something else to think about when you encounter something like this. So let's get on the whiteboard and do it. Okay, here's the part in all of its glory and wonderful dimensions. Black numbers are the imperial numbers. Green numbers are the metric equivalent, and the red is just the decimal equivalent of the fraction. As drawn on the print, like I showed you out there, the curve that it's shown between the cylinder and the ball is represented as such, but this is how it's actually going to look. If you were to drill a hole in a ball, it results in a flat plane, which is exactly what's going on here. 7 sixteenths of an inch center to center on the ends. This is not centered because these balls are different sizes. So the radius on the smaller ball naturally is less than the radius on the larger ball. Now where do you start? How do you do this? What's the approach? There is all the information you need to do this. This is actually not nearly as tough as it looks. Let's start with the center one. 3 sixteenths diameter. That's an 093 radius. Knowing that, we know that there's a triangle right here. Actually, let's do it on this side. It's much better. One leg of the triangle. It's the radius, right? There's a full-size cut right there, 093. We know that this is also 093 across, so the radius of 046 and a half is right here. You have the hypotenuse and one leg, a squared plus b squared equals c squared kicks in, and you can calculate this leg all day long. Same thing on this one. Radius 078. It is a 5 30 seconds or 156 diameter. The 078 is right here. O46 because it's the same center line coming across. 46 here too. It will allow you to calculate this. As soon as you have this one and this one, add them up, subtract them from this one, which is the center to center, and that will give you this. Do the exact same thing for the other side. 062 radius right here. 046, actually 046 and a half, right? Yep, 0465. Same here. Allows you to calculate this. will do the same guys with that. So I left that on there just to show you what it actually looks like. So this dimension will be exactly the same on either side. This dimension is called out as the same because 7 30 seconds is half of 7 sixteenths. You have all the stack that you need to do this. 
Remember that when you cut a circle, you can use the radius of the circle as the hypotenuse to figure out the chord, and it works extremely well. When I do this part, I'm going to do this part. Once I calculate how big this cut is right here, I'm going to take a round piece of material. I'm going to put two undercuts in it, and I'm going to form the radiuses with the two undercuts already done. So here's my tool right there. I'm going to put one undercut there. I'm going to put one undercut here. And then I will shape the radius in on both. I'll show you a neat trick for holding this. When you are finishing this piece up, they expect you to put a 100 or 2.5 millimeter square hole right in the center. I've got a great trick for that. You're going to like it. I like it. There it is. Uh, I know the drawing is a whole lot bigger than the part. Actually, the entire part is about that long right there. That's about the real size of this part. So this, there's a lot going on. It's very small. But knowing how to cut the geometry out and figure out what you have, the mechanics behind it, you have all the information you need, go get it. Let's grab a piece of material start cutting. Okay, this is 3 16 diameter cold roll steel. We're going to make a three-point barbell out of that with a couple of undercuts. I'm going to do a little bit of radius work on it. There will be some filing here unless you have a grinder, a wheel dresser, and a lot of patience. We're just going to have to try to form this freehand. I'm going to stay connected to the raw stock. I'm going to take it over to the mill, pop a couple of holes in it, and then we're going to put a square in the center before we part that off. So let's do it. First thing I'm going to do is face it off. Eventually I'm going to go for a 125 diameter, a 187 diameter, and a 156 back here. The undercuts are going to be 93 thou each. This is really a small part. And I'm hoping that when I drill it and put the square in the center that it doesn't bend back here. I may forego the details in the back until after the square and the hole are put in there. So I'm going to start with just the front ball, the undercut, and the center diameter leave it at that. Okay, for anyone not familiar with this particular measuring device right here, this is called a blade mic, and it is used specifically for small undercuts and areas where a standard anvil mic cannot access. O-ring grooves, piston ring grooves. And I'm looking for 093 on this cut right here. And you can see why this mic is just perfect for that.
unavoidably this part is so small my hand will be getting in your way I'm going to do the undercut right here I'm going to finish forming the back of the 125 diameter in the front and the 330 seconds round right here this ultimately has to be the same diameter as that but the drilling and milling operations that are going to take place in these areas I think this would compromise it and it would just make it too flexible under the pressure so I'm going to leave this big for now to expedite the process of these rounds you might want to put some chamfers on there to remove the bulk of the material then finish it with a file when you get close shine it up with some emery now I do trust the size of the material it's not going to flex as much as I thought so I'm going to finish that back diameter and a 156 diameter in the rear. For the filing work that I'm doing with these balls, the files that I'm using, I have taken the teeth off the edge of the file so I can get down in the undercut, use the undercut as the reference surface, and rock the file back and forth. And you can see that the first file in line here has still got sharp edges. The side is dull, but the edges are still very sharp. The second one in line has been chamfered on the edge as well get a reflection on it and the third one is the same so I'll use the second one this one here is the better choice see the teeth do not go all the way to the edge and that should work out quite well let's do it a real good way to accelerate a hand filed radius is to put a chamfer on it with a 45 degree tool to remove the bulk of the material. Don't get carried away with the chamfer tool or you're going to end up with a flat spot on the radius. Follow this up with the work with the file and check your progress ultimately with some emery cloth to see how smooth and how round your feature really is. We're going to go from here over to the mill and it's going to get handled again so no shine necessary right now. This part is a very unusual geometry and would be exceptionally hard to sweep or use an edge finder on so i'm using a solid quarter inch drill blank i'm going to sweep across the face of this part until i find a high spot well, just let's do it i'll show you what i'm talking about try not to snap it off in the meantime all right it's a quarter inch drill blank position just close to the part Visually going to line it up and move it in just a hair. Two thou feeler gauge. Zero out my digital. It is trapped. Sweep past it and see if we've got a good spot. Okay. Now I'm going to move in half the pin, which is 125.
effectively the center of that pin is now over the end of the part. I'm going to do the exact same thing with the ball itself. Two eighteen from the center of each one of the round features. 062 from the end of the round to the center of the round. Makes for a 280 shift to center. And re zero. The pin should now be directly over the ball. The big one in the middle. I like it. You could use an edge finder right now if you wanted to, if you can trust being on the high spot of that ball. I'm going to do the exact same thing with the feeler gauge and the pin. I trust it that much. Actually, let's go. Yeah, I trust it this way. Forgive the camera angle here for a second, guys. As soon as you have a little bit of tension, get off the part. Zero the Y. I'm going to move in the thickness of the shim and half the diameter of the pin. 127. That puts the pin over the edge. Now, whatever your diameter is here in the center, move in half of that. Looking for 093. If the planet's lined up this morning when I got out of bed, I am on location. I'm going to call that my zero zero spot. We're going to put flats on either side of the center ball. And then we're going to put a square hole in that. And I've been looking forward to that all day. This is where we put the flats on either side of the 187 diameter center feature on the crank. Print calls out for one eighth side to side. And it is a 5C spin indexer, so that makes it relatively easy. If I had to make two of these, the next one I would do, I'd have a flat on the small 1 8 ball on the end as well, even with the 093 undercut for cosmetics. I think that would work out much better when you add the brass handle to this component. Moving on to the drilling operation now, make sure your center drill is nice and sharp. And do be very delicate when you put the center spot, center drill in the end. You'll see some flex to this part. Just a little. There you go. The square in the center is called out as uh, a 0 .100 thousandths. That's about two and a half millimeter square. This end hole here is a 1 16th through hole. And I think uh, once it comes back into focus here, you'll see why a flat on that end ball would be better. Right now it's a very sharp edge. I'm going to go with the same 16th drill through the middle. Then I'm going to put a 1. That's, I'm not going to go with 100. I want to broach it to 100. This is about an 095 drill, which is just a little bit under. Nice and clean. Part is still in the 5C indexer, and I have a small file in my drill check. I am not going to turn the machine on. It is in back gear. It is in the lowest range. And by working the quill up and down, I'm going to file a hole in the center of that that's going to accept a 100 square gauge. I'll film a little bit of it. But I'm not going to film the whole thing because I can promise you this is going to take a while. The 
file is bigger than the hole and the file is positioned at 45 degrees so by applying pressure to the rear to the front left and right I can adjust the size of the square accordingly I'm going to be real delicate with this first couple of passes so I don't compromise anything the file is naturally going to find its way to the high spots on the circle so by putting pressure X and Y positive and negative it's going to find its way through now you're going to see some flex in the file right there and I can assure you that somewhere in the edited footage the file pressure is applied evenly and it is a tapered file so be real careful before the whole body of the file gets through this hole once it does get through you can apply a lot less pressure and let the file do the work and ultimately you'll come up with the size that you're looking for I did make a brass gauge to check the size and that square came out to around 104. Very pleased. Let's get back to the lathe and finish it. Finished length of the part is 577. I'm going to go partially way through it, finish as much of the rear radius as I can. Then cut it off. Five seventy seven. Here we go. I think that looks pretty close to me. Let's part it the rest of the way off. Take care of that by hand. All goes well. This should fit in a 316th collet. Risky, but it should fit. Okay guys, moment of brutal honesty here. When you make a part this small, I mean, that is an awesome looking crank handle, okay? <laughs> but when you edit something like this, when you put this on a computer monitor, it looks like this. Needless to say, not acceptable. I am going to touch this up. I'm gonna make a form tool real quick. And it's really, it shouldn't be all that bad, but I'm going to make a split bushing to hold this thing, and I'm going to make this shine like it's chrome-plated, because close enough on something like this just isn't good enough. It is tiny. I'm also going to throw one of these on it, just for laughs. Let's see how fast we can get this done. 
I'm going to take a quarter inch high speed square tool bit and we're going to make a form tool to correct that little knob this little guy here because that ball under magnification is just not round enough one in the center is good the one on the end is good but that 5 30 seconds radius on the end is just not cutting it this morning tip of the tool is blued it's locked in here because it's just easier if you're going to do a form tool just you have a nice registration surface for the radius gauge you can position it on the tool blank accordingly I'm gonna work from the toughest feature back and that means I'm gonna grind a nice radius on this and then I'm going to determine how deep it is at a later date right now the radius is the most important part so I'm gonna get in the way of the camera here for a second You see the line that's drawn on that this end of the tool here is much deeper than the allowable undercut in the tool or in the crank itself but after you grind the radius on you can nose this back and I'm pointing at this area right there so I'll grind the radius in here first to get a good profile and then I will adjust the nose of this back so it fits in the undercut on the part Going to rough this out on a pedestal grinder, then I'm going to come back and finish it with a cutoff wheel on a Dremel tool because you get a lot of control that way. All right, after about 15 minutes, being extra careful with the cutoff wheel on a Dremel, this is what we've come up with. And I think that's going to do the outside and inside radiuses quite nicely. Very mild relief on it, a lot of primary or secondary relief. The tough stuff right at the top should give us a nice profile. I'm going to do the nose of the part first, then I will grind this back for the undercut and hopefully come up with a ball that looks like it's chromed. Let's do it. We're going to do the outside part of the radius, outside radius first. And the form tool is as ground. You got to be really careful here. I'm going to put some Sharpie marker on it so we can see the contact. I'm going to come in with the OD first and then bump the carriage forward to clean up the radius. And I'll adjust both as I go along. Be real careful with this. The amount of contact you have on that radius tool is probably equal to or greater than the cross section of that 093. And a little too much pressure could just snap it right off. You can see the black left over from the Sharpie. Those are low spots on the ball. And I try to work them out until they disappear or become superficial enough to come off with emery. Okay, after about 15 trips back and forth to the pedestal grinder, and a whole lot of looking down through a jeweler's loop, I think I got the tool ground to where I like it. I wish I could get an overhead shot, but I cannot. I'm coming in from the back of the ball on this side, so the tool is in the undercut. We'll see if we can make this thing look round. Let's get overhead, see if I can get you a better shot of that. There it is. All right, there's a couple of bumps on it, but we're going to take a smooth file and round that off and polish that thing up like a trailer hitch. Nothing else will do. I'll be back. All right, a little tip for you. When you are trying to bring something to a very bright shine and it may have radial scratches in it, hit it with a Sharpie marker. And as you file or use your sandpaper over top of the part, the low spots will be black stripes like you see here. Now that is incredibly superficial, but when it comes to a high shine, that will be a distortion in the reflection and it'll stick out like a sore thumb. So although this is incredibly small, 
uh, devil's in the details, right? So I'm going to continue with this. I'm going to shine it up and show you what it looks like when it's done. But remember that tip. That's a good tip. Black Sharpie marker on the part as you file it or sand it or whatever. The low spots will continue to show up as black lines like you see here. And that is just unacceptable. With a little TLC and take your time, that's what you can achieve. You can still see some mild scratches in the 093 part of that. But as far as the reflectivity of that ball is concerned, I'm not complaining about that. That is a million times better than it was. And that son of a gun is tiny. I'm going to spin this around and polish up the other side just because I can't have it looking like that. And I'll make the brass crank for it. Damn, that's small. All right, no crank handle is complete without the actual handle part itself. This is brass, and this is one of those shape to fit. I like those kind of dimensions. <laughs> shape to suit. Love it. So, eighth inch diameter brass. I am going to stick this in there, form this up by hand. And the first thing I'm going to do is uh, take a parting tool and make a witness boundary mark on it so I know basically where everything is so it's visually appealing. This should be relatively quick, and I will back turn this. So the eighth inch material will be in the collet here, and I will plunge this undercut and feed it out and then part it off. That way you don't have to worry about sticking it back in the machine after the fact, because it's going to be pretty shiny when it drops off. Let's do it. First thing we're going to do here is face the front off as a reference surface. Going to bring the parting tool in and visually align the outside edge of the parting tool with the face. Move it in the length of the handle itself. That's 375 or about 10 millimeters. Bringing in a large radius tool, working back and forth now to give myself the profile I'm looking for. And as I'm moving it back and forth, I am diving it in. Doing that reduces the chance that this part is going to come up and over that tool. I'll form the ball on the end with a file. In the transition between the large radius and the major diameter of the material, that'll blend out with a piece of emery you'll see here in a second. So you get that, that elliptical bell looking shape on the end. This is one of those personal preference things as it develops. You machine it however suits your fancy. Now if you have to make three of these and you want them all to look the same, well you might want to take some numbers. If you have a digital readout that's easy to do is just pay attention to the digital, pay attention to the dials. And anybody that's ever polished anything to a high shine knows that even the smallest of scratches looks monumental when a thing is glass clean. And one of the other frustrations is chasing a scratch that's actually a reflection from some feature on the machine. <laughs> I've learned that the hard way several times. You move it out, make sure there's no polishing compound on the collet and come in and back turn the small diameter that's going to fit down inside the steel component of the handle assembly. Pay attention to the outside component. I'm looking at a jeweler's, looking through a jeweler's loop right now. As this diameter gets smaller, the only way to check it is with a blade mic, so that's what that was just there. As this diameter gets smaller, the sheer mass of the end of this part, although it is tiny, will have a tendency to want to whip. So if that starts to happen, be careful about how much surface contact you have or how high the RPM is. If that happens, you'll get a taper in this feature and it will be smaller towards the outside of the part and bigger towards the collet. Now when you're making this, it's called out as a 1 8 diameter all the way down, but remember the small end of the crank is 1 8 diameter, but when you pop a hole in it, it becomes much smaller where the land is. So if you want this to look relatively decent, put a chamfer on the back of this or turn this part down right here to considerably smaller. I'm going to, put, I'm, I'm going to turn it down and repolish it because I know what it's going to look like when it goes on and I'm not going to be pleased. As you turn this back diameter down, it is going to get longer. So if that's something that you still like the way it looks, by all means leave it, polish it up, and call it a day. But if you go back in there with the radius tool, be careful. Since it's a smaller driving diameter, 
the material is going to want to climb up and over that tool at a greater risk level, so be careful. Measure the thickness of the end of the crank where the 1 8 ball is that you just did, and this stem needs to be that long, maybe a little bit longer because they recommend peening it over. But this is so small, I guess uh, that is up to you how you're going to do that. Mine comes out to about 110. Register the parting tool on the inside of the large diameter, move it down 110, part it off. As with many of the small parts that I do, I am looking down on the top of the parting tool with a jeweler's loop. And from the turning operation, when I reduce that back diameter, not the small diameter, but the cosmetic diameter, it did leave a crown burr, so if you see some chips flying off, I know the comments are going to be, well, that's a little bit more than registering. Now I'm just removing the burr as well. And I know that the tool I used to put that undercut in there had a 20 thou radius on either side, so you'll see the radius go away here in a second. Right there. And now you simply shift over however long you want it since the outside of the parting tool is now a zero surface. A simple shift and you're done. Camera's going to cut out on the parting operation but you'll take a look at the assembly here shortly. Well, I hope you enjoyed watching that as much as I enjoyed doing it. I only have to make uh, two more of these handles, not the steel part. The rest is aluminum, so it's a lot easier. This is probably the toughest one. This is the cross slide setup. But two more of the brass sections out on the end. You know, if I get real cocky, I think I might just uh, figure out how to make that swivel so your hand doesn't get a blister when you crank it. <laughs> anyway, thanks for watching, guys. Hang in there until next time. Stay healthy. Joe Pye at Advanced Innovations in Austin, Texas. I'm out. <laughs> Shut up! There you go. Holy cow, that took a while. All right, we're back.